So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our nature, sinful desires were at work with, uh, within us. And the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we have died to it, and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of its living spirits. All right, good morning. Good morning. Man, it's good to be in this room, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yes, it is good to see so many joyous faces in this room, too, and I'm thankful for that. It's been a good morning already. Um, it's hard to get much better, I don't think, than, um, than leaders coming up and pleading uh, for our transformation into Christ. It's hard to get much better than that, and so I'm blessed, I'm humbled uh, to get to uh, share in some words this morning that can hopefully challenge us and move us more to the image of Christ. Uh, I was asked Braden to read uh, earlier this week, and uh, I love the message that he responded with. He said, I'll have to practice, and uh, you did a great job, Braden. and uh, we, we are better for paying attention to the word. I often say I, I know that yeah, we're settling in, and, and traditions can sometimes um, lose their significance if we're not careful. But it is a wonderful, wonderful practice to give attention to the word and to read it out loud. And for young men like Braden to practice and to stand up and to try um, to speak those words well. And so uh, give some attention back to Romans, if you don't mind. I'll, I'll be talking uh, about a lot of the principles that Paul revealed in Romans. Uh, this study this week has made me want to dig back into Romans. I know we did that about four years ago here, for some of you who remember I was so blessed by that. Um, I, I heard a preacher say one time that, that he reads Romans every year. And he, and, and, and he said, and if you think that that's too much, um, then you don't know Romans. And, and he's right. Romans is a wonderful book. But Braden read from us from Romans chapter 7, and you heard some things like this. You heard some things like made to die to the law. You heard some things like sinful passions that are aroused by the law. That one makes me think. You heard things like released from the law. And if you keep reading, uh, I believe it's verse 7 um, after verse 6, Paul anticipated that after such language, folks would ask, well, the law is bad then, right? The law must be bad. To which Paul would respond, no, the law is not sin. He would actually say, may it never be, God forbid. And that's because law is good, okay? I want, I, I want you to hear me say that this morning. That's really important. I don't want you to mishear me saying that today. Law is good, and law is good especially when it's God's law, right? Especially when it's God's law. Law helps us to know when we've messed up. You ever think about law that way? Law helps you to know when you've messed up. When a heart cares about doing right, does your heart care about doing right? Have we gathered with people together in this room this morning whose heart really does care about doing right? I'm not asking if you're perfect or if you always do right, but does your heart care about doing right? Well, laws help give us guidance so that our heart can be guarded against shame and regret. Okay, laws help the heart have um, a guardian, if you will. When I teach this, I always feel like traffic laws make a good analogy. Okay, I, I've, I've mentioned these laws before, and, 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 and they help me, so I share them with you. For instance, when you realize that you're speeding in a school zone, okay, many of, many of us have sped in school zones accidentally. When you realize that you're speeding in a school zone, is your initial thought, it's not fair that the speed limit has changed. It's not fair or good that I have to slow down. Is that your initial thinking? I hope not. I hope not. I hope you're not angry by... By the, by the law to reduce your speed in a school zone. Hopefully, we think, oh, no, we need to slow down because it is, it is good to drive carefully when children or pedestrians may be present. Okay, hopefully we're not 
angry that there is a law that, 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 that guards our heart against something that we would regret and feel so bad about if, if, um, if, we, if we hurt someone. And that's because laws protect us, right? Uh, they protect our hearts from hurting. Romans 3 and 20 says this. You might take a note. Laws reveal sin. That's so good. But think about this, and this is really the point of Romans and the point of the New Covenant. Laws don't fix sin. That's Romans 3, verse 20. They reveal sin, but they don't fix sin. That's because for a perfect heart, you really got to think on this with me. It's really a simple lesson, I think, once we get there, but we got to build to that simplicity. That's because for a perfect heart, or let me say it this way, for a heart that is perfected, okay, I don't have a perfect heart, but I have a heart that is perfected by Jesus. For a perfect heart, laws become obsolete. Now, don't hear me wrong. That doesn't mean we disobey laws. Paul would say, because of this grace that Mark spoke of a minute ago, grace and truth, that law is actually strengthened. Law is held up. So, so I'm not saying we disobey law. I won't say that all day. But for a heart that is perfected, for a heart that is transformed, laws become the old way. Laws become obsolete. And I'll give you some, some verses there maybe to, to, to think on that one with me. A heart that perfectly, right, a heart that perfectly cares, a heart that is perfectly mindful doesn't have to be told to slow down in school zones, right? A heart that perfectly cares, a heart that is perfectly mindful does not need laws to ensure that it does right. We're here today because we believe that God and his way is perfect, amen? We do. He is so good. And his way is so right. And think about this. God is not guarded by laws, is he? Laws are not what, what keep God uh, being good. God is good. God is right. And his way is right. And the gospel of the new covenant is this, okay? This is the gospel at the front end of a sermon. Talk about violating traditions, right? I, I, I want to make sure we hear the gospel throughout our conversation together. The gospel of the new covenant is this. This is so good makes me excited, is that through Jesus, God's way, through God's Spirit, is dwelling in us. Through faith in Jesus as both just and justifier, the perfect one, God's way dwells within us. God's way transforms us. God's way conforms us to the likeness of His Son. Again, no longer needing laws because we are led by God and his goodness. You know, this has been God's plan for, for human beings from the beginning. Think about it with me. I always like taking things back to the garden. I think we're going back there in some wonderful and mysterious way. At the very beginning of creation, it was this law of do not taste that enticed those first humans, Adam and Eve, to sin. Those the laws weren't meant to govern and to guide and to burden human beings. That's not God's plan. But what governed and guided human beings was this wonderful relationship with God, walking with him, not needing laws and rules like the covenant of Moses. And God's wonderful plan is that through Jesus, through the Spirit of God, through faith in Jesus and through God's Spirit, we're not burdened by law anymore. We're not. We're led by the way of God. It's a beautiful gospel, and, and Paul was all over it in Romans. It's really what Romans is all about. I remember a few years ago when, when I asked you, I said, hey, y'all, does anybody have some prior knowledge of Romans? I don't remember who said this, but somebody in this room, when I said, hey, what's Romans all about? Somebody said, freedom. Right. Romans is about freedom. Read it with me. Braden read it. We're going to read it one more time, Braden. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in regard to the law through the body of Christ so that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, 
in order that we might bear fruit for God. We were put to death to the law. How? Through the body of Christ. That's good news. I love this language so much. Um, bearing fruit for God. We're kind of out of the garden season, aren't we? Bearing fruit in our gardens and whatnot. We, some of you might have had some frost this morning. How good does it feel, brethren, when somebody brings you some good first fruits from their garden? How good does it feel when somebody shares with you something that is, that is new and ripe and grown and wonderful? I love being a part of a congregation that during the right season we have a, a bounty of fruit back here on the table. Brethren that stand up and say, hey, take some home with you. That's good. Have you ever thought about how um, it pleases God? Thinking about this verse. It pleases God like someone who is pleased to have fresh garden vegetables and fruit. It pleases God when we are like Jesus. When we walk and live in conformity to Jesus. When we let go of, 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 of our flesh and our desires and our ways of thinking and we conform to the image and likeness of Jesus. When you, when you don't have to be burdened and held down and told, hey, don't murder or don't speed in school zones. <laughs> because you're following a law that is deeper, that is greater, that is better, that is stronger. This is what God wants. Continue with me in Romans, and you keep seeing it. This is verse 5 of Romans chapter 7. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions, which were brought to light by the law. That's what law does. It brings to the light our error. It brings to the light our sinful passions. They were at work in the parts of our body to bear fruit for death. Next verse. Verse 6. I don't have it memorized. But now we have been released from the law having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not the oldness of the letter. I ask you this morning, we'll jump into Ezra here in just a minute. Are you still in the flesh? Are you enslaved by law? What's that look like? Are you here this morning because you have to be? Are you aroused by rules? Do they aggravate you that you can't do this and you can't do that because of a, a verse you see in Scripture? Are you bound to the oldness of the letter? You know, if you think of this book, I love you enough to tell you this. If you think of this book as just a burdensome rule book, then you're bound to the oldness of the letter. You're bound. You know, I was thinking today how I wish everybody would follow it. Even if their heart didn't want God, I still wish they would follow it because the law is good, right? It's good. I wish everybody practiced what Jesus preached, even if they didn't love Jesus. I wish they still practiced what he preached. I wish they'd still try to obey his teachings and his way. I wish everybody would do that. How good the world would be, right? But here's the thing. If your heart doesn't belong to God, are you listening? If your heart doesn't belong to God, then you get no credit for just following a rule book. If you've not submitted and surrendered your way and your heart entirely to God, then you get no credit for just following a list of rules. Similar to how we don't reward obedience, you know? Have you, have you ever really considered that? Um, when I abide by that law driving through that school zone in the morning, the traffic guard doesn't give me a present for obeying the law. That'd be nice, maybe like a biscuit or something, you know? No, that doesn't happen. We're thankful for obedience to law. I'm certainly thankful, especially in a world that, 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 that seems to be violating laws that, 
that look after one another. I'm thankful for that. But again, we get no prize for being law-abiding. Rather, law-abiding simply identifies one who does what they should do, and especially what they should do if laws are good and if laws are godly. This may sound odd. It, 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 it sound, I have to be so careful because it still sounds odd for me too at times. But when we left off in Luke months ago, the last time we were in this room, we left off with Luke 17, 7 through 10. Do you recall? Jesus taught this about law and about not getting a reward for just following the rules. Jesus taught this. Luke 17, 7 through 10. He said this, Which of you, having a slave, by the way, we are the slave in this parable, which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come into the field, come immediately, sit down and eat? Do you, do you see the parable here? Which of you will say to your slave, let me reward you for your labor, for, for, for doing what you should be doing? This is what Jesus is saying. He says, but no, you will say to him, perhaps prepare something for me to eat, Properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink. Verse 9, he does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? This is Jesus' teaching. Verse 10, so you too, when you do all the things that are commanded you, what is your response? I guess I earn heaven now, right? Because I followed the rules. I guess I earn your reward and a relationship with you because I did the things that you created humans to do? What does Jesus teach? Respond this way. We are unworthy slaves. You are the one who is worthy. You are the one who is holy. Why did you make us to give you glory and praise? We have done only that which we ought to have done. Amen. Again, we struggle with this, and we struggle with this. I struggle with this, especially if my fundamental understanding of God is that I earn him through my works, that I earn him through my obedience. But again, God does not honor our obedience. He honors our love. And if we love him, then we what? We keep what? His commandments. You see that? By loving him, what do we do? We keep his commandments. You don't have to tell me not to speed in the school zone. Because <laughs> I love you, God. I love these kids. You don't have to tell me not to murder my brother. Why? Because I love you, God. And I love your way. You don't have to tell me not to, not to talk bad about my enemies. Because I love you, God. And you, you love your enemies. You don't, you don't have to tell, Romans is so beautiful, Romans 14 especially, you don't have to tell me not to do X. Or you don't even have to say that I can do X, because I won't do X if it means my brother stumbles or is hurt. It's a beautiful gospel. Again, I know we struggle with it, and so I try to help us make sense of it, but, 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 but trust me, my heart is that I want us to follow this so much, because it's a different way. It's a transforming way. Changes our community. Changes our church. Changes who we are. Changes how we gather. Changes how we just keep rules. Changes everything. And again, the greatest motivation is love. John 14 and 15. Spot on, my brothers. Thank you up there. Spot on. As our love increases, the burden of obedience decreases. Hang on to that one. I plan to. As my love increases the burden of obedience decreases. Notice, I'm not saying that we become people who disobey. Not at all. Remember, Paul said the law is strengthened through this way of grace and truth and love. But as my love increases, the burden of obedience decreases. But the rules that taught me and guarded me in my immaturity no longer lead me because something deeper leads me now. 
the helper, the spirit of truth, if we keep reading in John 14. Look at verse 16 if your Bible is there. We have this wonderful helper, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit that guides us into the way that is right. We submit to him. We say, God, it's your way. It's not my way. God, I welcome you into my life. I want you to lead me. And we have this wonderful helper. Such is the relationship. This is fundamental to our understanding of being a Christian. Fundamental. Such is the relationship between the old and the new covenant. A covenant of law. A covenant of sacrifice. Versus a covenant of grace and compassion and mercy. Abandoning truth, never. Strengthening truth. Always. A system of salvation by law, the old covenant, versus a system of salvation by grace through faith. Romans 6 and verse 7. I bring you back there. We just read it. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not the oldness of the letter. What does that mean? Do we serve in the newness of the spirit here today? Or do we serve in the oldness of the letter here today? I want us to be free. The newness of the Spirit. It looks like living free by faith in Jesus as the Christ. The oldness of the letter being burdened by keeping commandments. The newness of the Spirit is trusting Jesus as the righteousness. The one who imparts righteousness to us. Both just and therefore justifier. The oldness of the letter, striving to achieve righteousness myself, constantly in limbo and in worry that I'm not good enough. The oldness of the letter. The newness of the spirit, having the power of God to resist temptations and sins. Listen here. Having the power of God to fight against temptation and sins. That's the newness of the spirit versus the oldness of the letter, trying to fight against temptations every single day over and over and over and over again. That's the oldness of the letter. Man, I want us to know this. The oldness of the letter, bearing fruit for death. The newness of the spirit, bearing fruit for who? God. Bearing fruit for our God, the newness of the Spirit. And so here's the point that we make, and here's where we go home and we wrap up the book of Ezra, okay? Because in the book of Ezra, I think, and I've asked you to journey with me now, in the book of Ezra, I I believe we see a return and a rebuild based on the oldness of the letter. And so it becomes so paramount and so good for us as a people of faith. He gave me an amen. Did y'all hear that? It becomes so good for us as a people of faith to read and to study the wonderful words of God, these ancient words, as, as were said a moment ago, to study them and to realize that our example is Jesus. We learn so much from Ezra and Nehemiah, but our example is Jesus. And so if we return and rebuild with the oldness of the letter as our guide, is rule-keeping as our guide with obedience, and again, rule-keeping as our end, as our ultimate, then we will experience what Ezra and Nehemiah got. Have you read it? He, he's pulling out his hair. He's tearing his clothes. The book of Ezra literally ends with a list of sinners. Again, if we return and rebuild with the oldness of the letter as our, gui- as our guide, we will experience what Ezra experienced. But if we return and rebuild with the newness of the Spirit as our guide, with total submission, how many of us have really considered total submission to Jesus Christ? Everything. If we return and we rebuild with total submission as our guide, with faith and conformity to Jesus as our end, as our everything, then we will experience the kingdom of God. That's what we'll experience. As Jesus, our teacher, prayed, your will on earth as it is where? In heaven. 
if we return and rebuild with, with conformity to Jesus as our end, surrender to him as our end, then we will experience the kingdom of God. Total submission, total surrender. I believe many of us, myself included, are used to a church experience that is driven by do's and don'ts. One more time, I believe many of us, myself included, are used to a church experience. We might even crave a church experience that keeps us guarded by do's and don'ts. Even and especially in regard to what we do and don't do on Sunday. But the church of Jesus Christ is better. And the church of Jesus Christ is deeper. And the church of Jesus Christ is stronger. It involves a greater obedience that is not burdensome. You hear me? It involves a sincere life that is without guile, that is open. What you see is what you get. I'm a messed up guy who's trying to follow Jesus and who is saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And we get real with each other, like it's on the back of our t-shirts, and we go home. That's what we experience. In Ezra and Nehemiah, we see a return and a rebuild that is based on the law system again, and it did not work. Let me talk about that for a minute, and then we'll close. I don't want anybody to hear me say that I don't admire Ezra. I'm afraid that some of the lessons that I've taught may have sounded like me being critical of Zerubbabel or Ezra or Nehemiah. I'm not trying to be that way. I'm just trying to help us see that Jesus is better. He's better than Zerubbabel. He's better than Ezra. He's way better than Nehemiah. Not that Nehemiah was worse than those two. It's better than Stephen, better than anybody in this room. Jesus is better. So that's been the aim. I want to meet Ezra. I feel like I can relate to that guy. A guy that, 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 that really thought with all of his heart that if you pound this, people will respond. They'll get it. That's what he thought. That's what he attempted. That's what he returned to do. But he found out that wasn't the case. There was something more needed. What was needed? A Messiah. A Savior. One who is both just and justifier was needed. That's what Ezra found out. Ezra was a priest and a scribe. The text says he was skilled in the law of Moses. If I give you my book, my Bible this morning, next to this verse, you'll see this is so cool. <laughs> he had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and his ordinances to Israel. I don't question his heart. I don't question his intention. I think about how he probably did the best he knew to do with what he had to do it. He wanted to lead people to God, and he wanted to use God's law to do it. But what did Paul and Romans teach us, and what did Jesus prove? Law can't do that. Law can't lead us to God. It can guard our hearts and help us, and it's good, but it can't fix us. Only Jesus can do that. Only complete and total surrender to Jesus can do that. That's it. Hebrews 7, I've mentioned Hebrews a lot. I couldn't help but think of this. You don't have to turn there, I'll read it. It says, for on the one hand, there is a setting aside of the former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there, there, there is this bringing of a better hope. I think Ezra wanted to bring hope. He just didn't have that better hope yet. And that better hope is the way by which we draw near to God, the Hebrew writer said, because the rule way is a weak way. And I need to say this because it's important. In a church that only pounds the rules is weak too. A church that only pounds the rules is weak to the greater power that is Jesus Christ and his spirit. Ezra was one of whom the world was not worthy, the Hebrew writer would say. Ezra was one who gained approval through his faith. He really believed this, the Hebrew writer would say. But Ezra was also one who did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us. What is that better, church? His name is on our sign, Jesus. 
Ezra attempted a return and rebuild that was based on the law of Moses. And again, it resulted in a big list of sinners. It resulted in him pulling out his hair and tearing his clothes. And I'll very quickly show you. Ezra was tasked with bringing the law back to Jerusalem. In weeks prior to this, we've talked about Zerubbabel and how he rebuilt the temple. Well, by the time Ezra gets onto the scene in Ezra 7, the temple's already been rebuilt. Okay, now Ezra's going to restore temple practice. He's going to restore temple worship. And, and I hope you're seeing how a lot of this plays so well into what we're trying to do today. You know, Ezra, Ezra wanted to come back to Jerusalem, to this new temple, and make it be done right. You know what? And the king of Persia, I won't spend a lot of time on this this morning. I did last week. I love how the king of Persia blessed him in this. A, a, a pagan king said, I, I want the prayers of your God. That's so cool. So A lot of application there too. In Ezra 7, 27, this, I appreciate these things. I'll just mention them quickly. We see Ezra pray. We see him again pray. That's 7, 27. We again see him pray in Ezra 9. We see this prayer of confession. Guys, these prayers are moving I, I invite you to spend some time in these prayers. They're moving. These prayers of a, of a faithful man who loved the law of God, they're moving. Spend some time in them. And so Ezra goes to Jerusalem. This is chapter 8. Again, I, I, don't, don't take my word. Study this. <clears throat> in Ezra chapter 8, he goes to Jerusalem. He brings a, a lot of folks with him after a sincere time of prayer and fasting. He goes to Jerusalem and he takes literally thousands of pounds of offerings. He, he is bringing the best that he knows to bring to the temple for temple worship. It says the people in addition brought 12 bulls. Bring 12 bulls this morning. Wow, like 96 rams, 77 lambs. 12 male goats and, and, and burnt offerings to the Lord. This is what they brought to the temple to praise God with. And, and, and everything, if you read it, everything finds its authority in the law, the law of Moses, right? Ezra and the priest, all that they did finds their authority in the law of Moses. And the law of the temple was being upheld. What, what can I compare this to? It's like... They, 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 they brought the best to worship God, and a lot of it. Great day, I could hear Ezra saying. Great worship. So good. Maybe even thoughts like, it's so good to be back. So great to be back. What happens next, follow, following chapter 8, is this. This is 9 and verse 1. Now when these things had been completed, the princes approached me. This is Ezra talking here. I kind of envisioned this this week as just a little tap on the shoulder after a great and wonderful, powerful worship. Just a little tap on the shoulder. Hey, Ezra, I hate to tell you, man, but... The people of Israel, even the priests, the one who are leading the worship and the sacrifice, you following? The people of Israel, even, even the Levites, they've not separated themselves from the peoples of the land. And they've not separated themselves from the abominations of the peoples of the land. What that looked like for them was intermarriage, something God had told them not to do. It looked like marrying people who were loyal to other gods and to idols, who, who used their life to worship other gods and, 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 and practice the worship of other idols. That's what it looked like then. In my Bible, what I have written down is this. They didn't live sanctified. You know what that means? They didn't live set apart. 
Their lives look like the lives of everybody else around them. Their, their idols were the gods of the people around them. They sacrificed and they gave their time and their attention and they listened to and they even, even took in and learned from the ways of the godless people around them. Hey, Ezra, we had a great day of worship. as a lot of bulls here and cat and but the people aren't sanctified. They're not set apart. They're not different. So what does Ezra do? What does Ezra do? You keep reading. You see it in the text. What did he do? The people, their leaders, have been, had incorporated this pagan lifestyle among their ways. They were, uh, remember last week we said you can't have God plus another something. God plus an idol equals nothing, Right? This is what the people had done. Their temple practice, though it was by the book, so to speak, meant nothing. As we said before, their obedience got no credit, right? They, they, they obeyed the law, but their heart was far from God. The question becomes for us, as we draw to a close, the question becomes for us, are we like them? Are we people who obey the book? We might have it memorized, every verse of it. But are our hearts surrendered to God, his way, his way with my enemies, his way with my hobbies, his way with my career and my job, certainly his way in my home and with my family, and with my kids, are we surrendered to God? That's the question. That's the application of the whole book of Ezra. Are we like these people? Are we returning today without surrender? Are we doing it according to the book, but without surrender? Did we come back to a building today with a heart that is far from God? Are we sharing allegiance to this world? then today is no return, if that's the case. It's not. It's not what we've been preaching for the past few weeks either. Not a return to a building. Not a return to a, a, a great building. I'm glad we're here and not out speeding in school zones. You hear me? I'm so glad we're here. This does my heart so good. But i got to tell you, if we're just returning to a building and we're not surrendered to God, then sadly this means nothing. I don't believe in, um, I don't, tr I try not to, I don't believe in prayers that save us as is taught by many today. And instead, I believe that salvation comes by grace through faith and that we respond in faith. So, so, so hear me, I don't, I don't believe in the prayers that save us like many teach today, but, but I do believe that prayers are such an important part of our repentance Confession and prayer is such an important part of our transformation and our confirmation into the image of Christ. And that's why I tell you these prayers, guys, these prayers of Ezra and this prayer in chapter 9. I want to read it for you and we're done. Do you mind? This is 9 and verse 6 of Ezra. The question is, is this attitude of surrender in us that is in Ezra? Again, is this attitude of surrender in us that is in Ezra? Are we here today with it all right? Or is this attitude of surrender in us as it was in Ezra? Verse 6 of chapter 9. Oh my God, I am ashamed and I am embarrassed to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen above our heads as our guilt has grown even to the heavens. What a prayer. Since the days of our fathers, to this day we have been in great guilt. And on account of our iniquities, we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to open shame as it is to this day. I see me in this. 
But now for a brief moment, grace. How often God's grace, now for a brief moment, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us in an escaped remnant. I'm thankful that I'm alive today in God's grace and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage. For we are slaves. Yet in our bondage our God has not forsaken us but has extended loving kindness to us. In the sight of the kings of Persia, to give us reviving, to raise up the house of our God. We have an opportunity to raise up the house of our God. I'm not talking about a building. To restore its ruin and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem to put up a way that the enemies can't penetrate. Now our God, what shall we say after this? For we have again forsaken your commandments. Perhaps we've returned and rebuilt on a way that is old and not this new way of your spirit, which you have commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying the land which you are entering to possess is unclean. You warned us, O God, with the uncleanness of the peoples of the land and with their abominations surrounded which have filled it from end to end with their iniquity. So now do not give your daughters to their sons, is what God said. Do not give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it as an inheritance to your sons forever. After all that has come upon us from our evil deeds and our great guilt, since you are God, have requited us. Look at this phrase. (coughs) You, God, have requited us less than our iniquities deserve and have given us an escaped remnant as this. God, shall we again, what the, the opportunity we have today, guys, to return. But shall we again break your commandments and intermarry with the peoples who commit these abominations? God, you've given us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Here we stand again today on the threshold of something. Thank you, God, that is new. It was hard, but it's new. It was an opportunity. And here we stand on the threshold of it again. Will we take this opportunity and keep committing abominations with the people of the land? And if that's the case... If that's the case, would you not be angry with us to the point of destruction until there is no remnant nor any who can escape? O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we have been left an escaped remnant as it is this day. Behold, we are before you in our guilt. For no one can stand before you because of this. Do we stand guiltless and defiant and arrogant today? That's a burdensome way to be, guys. Or do we realize our guilt and we humbly seek God's way and are we made free by the one who is both just and justifier? The perfect image of grace and truth. What I read next is an incredible response. I pray that you'll spend some time in it. This large assembly listened to their priest, Ezra. The, 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 the um, parallel is to, for us to listen to our priest, Jesus. They recognized God as merciful. They recognized God as their only hope. They confessed their unfaithfulness. They made a covenant to put away all idolatry and to obey. Guys, I think that's what baptism is supposed to reflect. This covenant, to put it away. To be different, to be surrendered. That's what it's supposed to reflect. Again, they listen to their priest, will re-listen to ours. I'm amazed at their repentance. I really am. One of the hardest things I've ever had to counsel is when two relationships that, that are uh, united or engaged or 
dating or whatever, one of the hardest things that I've ever had to counsel someone is when their relationship may not be pleasing unto God. It's hard to do that to two people that are in a relationship. Oftentimes when I've had to counsel that, um, the result is they don't like me for having said it. I don't think I've ever at least immediately experienced a relationship that is broken in that fear of it not pleasing God. We, we hang on to relationships. R relationships are hard to break, even if they're not godly. They're hard to break, aren't they? Guys, in this story, we see repentance and trust in God that even breaks relationships. It breaks idolatrous relationships. You're into something today that you know is not godly. Maybe you've wrapped your whole life up in it. I don't know what it is, but you do. You know? It sits in your closets, or it consumes your devices. Maybe it's your schedule, job. I don't know what it is, but you do. Guys, one of the hardest things to do is to break a relationship. But these people, so moved by their God, so desiring to surrender their life to him, you know what they did? They broke those relationships. Their repentance, their story of repentance is one of God. You get everything. You get all of it. We're going in. Now, again, it didn't work. It was based on law. <laughs> but you and I have a better covenant. We have a greater redeemer, a stronger way to follow God, to be committed and allegiant to him. And I'd love to see a, a, a response like Ezra got, but the response be to Jesus, to Jesus. Does that make sense? Back to uh, <clears throat> Romans, just two verses, maybe three, back to what was read. Let's see if it makes even more and more sense, but now... We have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not the oldness of the letter. God, we're all in with you, and we're trusting your promise to be our helper. I couldn't help but also mention chapter 8 and how this chapter begins in Romans. Therefore, you know this one, there is no condemnation for those who are in who? Christ, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Will you respond to Jesus today, ready to submit, ready to surrender, and let that be our return and rebuild? The invitation is yours, and Philip's going to lead our singing.